Are you ready to take your health to the next level? Join me as we explore every piece of a puzzle for a quality life. Join our show, Quality Life, Your Choice. So today we will be discussing about disarming diabetes. Uh, if you would notice in the previous discussion that we have uh, when we talk about immunity and um, the in, uh, increasing immunity and then the chronic diseases, makikita po natin doon that diabetes is uh, included okay, on the list. Uh, if you can see now in your screen, uh, you will see there that cardiovascular disease is number one and pangalawa yung diabetes. You will also see there chronic respiratory disease, abnormal high blood pressure, cancer. So, um, uh, if you would notice uh, doon sa mga existing na mga patients who are developing fatal conditions in this uh, time of um, pandemic are those uh, that have the pre-existing conditions nga. We know very well that everybody now is so um, concerned about uh, COVID-19, no? So, lahat ng tao ngayon, ang focus is nandoon sa pandemic, doon sa communicable disease. But we should never disregard the top killer diseases that we have in the country. Kasi kahit pa meron tayong uh, number of deaths na na-document daily on COVID-19, kung titignan mo yung mga datos, mas mataas pa rin yung mga namamatay because of the lifestyle-related diseases. So, yun yung pag-uusapan natin ngayon. Here, the data that we have from the World Health Organization, these are the leading cause of death worldwide. So, lima ito kung titignan natin. So, uh, included here is cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, cancer, diabetes, and stroke. Now, this is the data from the, Depart uh, from the World Health Organization, but this is also true in the Philippines. Okay? So, if you notice, all of these five are all lifestyle related. Yes, we have the infectious disease right now, pero kung titignan natin, this top five cause of death, it's also coexisting with a communicable disease. And more so, kung meron ka nitong mga communicable disease na to, this poses you more to the risk of developing fatal condition when you get infected with the current COVID-19 right now. Now, I have here the data from the Department of Health. Uh, these are the top 10 causes of death uh, in the Philippines. So, they were able to report this in February 2019. And you will see here that 24.4% of the death is caused by disease of the heart. Now, baba ako kaagad dun sa diabetes ha, because that will be the topic for today. So, yung diabetes comprises about 6% of the death. Okay? So, total death. Now, that is the report from the Department of Health. Ngayon, I'll show you another data here coming from the National Statistics Office or the NSO. So, they are relatively the same. Looking at it, yung pinakamataas pa rin cause of death is ischemic heart disease. So, ito yung may mga bara sa ugat ng puso. And then, diabetes is right there. Now, I want to show you the numbers. Um, this was reported in June 2019. Inilabas siya ng June 2019, but in fact, the data is 2017. Ganun po talaga siya. Okay, so the reported um, deaths in 2017 is about 579,237. Okay, so kung translate natin yan, the average would be about 1,500 to 1,600 deaths a day, per day. So, kung gusto natin ng per minute, ibig sabihin, may isang taong namamatay kada minuto sa Pilipinas. Alright? Now, let me bring you to the numbers again. Okay? So, here is the number. If you will see in your screen right now, the number of daily deaths in ischemic heart disease is over 200. To be exact, this is 230 deaths secondary to ischemic heart disease daily. Okay? Let me go down to diabetes. In diabetes, 85 person is dying every single day of diabetes. Okay? So, balik tayo doon sa pinakita natin kanina doon sa COVID-19. Sa data na pinakita ko sa inyo kanina, now, since January 20, na nag-document ang Department of Health, up to the present, we have 182 deaths. Alright? So, so, 182 deaths from January to April 8 
ilan yon sa isang araw. Okay, so I'm not discounting the effect of COVID-19 because it's really necessary because this is an acute condition, this is a pandemic, but lest we forget the, communic the non-communicable diseases, mas magkakasakit pa rin at mas mamamatay pa rin ang mga Pilipino. Alright? Now, going back, again, there are about 85 Filipinos who are dying every single day of diabetes. This is diabetes. Okay? Now, you might be asking me, why would I go straight to diabetes? Eh, yung number one cause of death pala is cardiovascular disease. Okay? Now, you will see here, that diabetes, we call them sometimes as the mother of many types of diseases. No? Because looking at the complication of diabetes, just because they are affecting the blood vessels that would supply all our organs from head to foot, ibig sabihin, ang complication niya is also from head to foot. Okay? So our eyes may be affected, uh, patients with diabetes may develop heart attack, stroke, peripheral artery disease, yung mata apektado, they may develop cataract, they may develop glaucoma, diabetic foot, they may develop diabetic nephropathy, yung kidneys affected, and then they will also have um, uh, peripheral neuropathy. Okay, so they have numbness, they have pain on the extremities, so on and so forth. Okay, so yes, number one cause of death is heart disease, but mind you, ang diabetes is really atherogenic. So let's discuss diabetes this time. Now, I already showed you the top 10 causes of death in the Philippines, and so we are posed with many different problems. The number one problem we have is more than 70% of the cause of death is lifestyle related diseases. Isn't it right? The number two problem is that. Chronic disease is consistently increasing exponentially despite advances in medical science. You know, I would think sana kasi nagiging advanced na yung ating medical uh, science, yung availability ng medicine natin, and then yung mga hospitals natin dumadami na rin, and yung accessibility and na rin, you know, for people to have medical care. But despite all this development, yung chronic disease is just increasing. It never went down. Okay? The num number three problem is Filipinos are prematurely and unnecessarily dying of diseases that are highly preventable. So, ibig sabihin, ito yung mga sakit, chronic diseases, na pwede naman palang may magawa para ma-prevent siya. Okay? Now, number four problem is chronic disease is now affecting younger individuals. So, kung kayo nakinig dun sa lecture natin nung nakaraan, we talk about aging, right? So, ibig sabihin yung aging kasi hindi na ibig sabihin na uh, chronologically, pareho yung age mo biologically. Okay? So, right now, kahit 65 years old ka na, pwede yung katawan mo is younger than that. Pero, pwede naman ngayon na 32 years old lang yung pasyente, pero yung edad ng katawan, biologically, pwedeng nasa 50s na siya. Okay? Now, chronic diseases is now affecting younger individuals. And lastly, this is the problem, of course, with all these types of chronic disease, you may need maintenance medication and they would always say this is for life. Diba? Na tinitake nila. So that means this will drain budget in the household and also national budget. Why would I say national budget? Kasi maraming gamot na maintenance na pinamimigay at the grassroots dun sa mga healthcare centers natin. Isang irony lang dito is, nagbibigay tayo ng maintenance medication para sa diabetes. Nagbibigay tayo ng maintenance medication para sa hypertension. Pagkatapos pumila at kumuha ng gamot na maintenance refill doon sa ating mga healthcare centers, didiretso sa tindahan, anong bibilin? Isang bote ng soft drink. Okay? Kakakuha lang ng gamot para sa diabetes, di ba? Or bibili ng uh, tuyo or dried fish, no? Kakakuha lang ng gamot para sa hypertension, di ba? So, what we're seeing right now is really lack of information and education at the grassroots. Okay? So, uh, ito yung mga problems na nakikita natin in terms of developing chronic diseases. Okay? So, diabetes is included in those chronic diseases. Now, bakit natin uumpisahan sa diabetes? Now, you will see in your screen right now that diabetes is in fact declared as an epidemic in the Philippines since year 2019. Pag sinabi mong epidemic, eto. 
No? In fact, if I were to say, diabetes is a pandemic because it's been affecting the entire world. Kung titignan mo yung statistics, konting-konti yung COVID-19 compared to diabetes statistics that we have. But it's just that yung, yung, yung uh, infectious disease kasi is an acute condition that we have to take care of it right away. Yung diabetes naman, ang pagkakaiba, this is a chronic condition and most patients with diabetes don't really feel anything, you know, until they are diagnosed with diabetes and marami nga sa kanila sinasabi pa, I don't really feel bad at all. Yung labs lang nagsasabi na may sakit ako. You know, so that's why, uh, medyo hindi rin sila na encourage na mag-change, you know, or or uh, to change into a healthy lifestyle. Now, uh, actually, in this time of pandemic, I am I am starting to appreciate, uh, you know, the efforts na ginagawa ng mga tao ngayon, kasi people right now are more health conscious than ever. No? So, uh, I would see siguro na yung 2020 natin na statistics in terms of chronic diseases, baka may chances na bumaba siya kasi uh, people now are really more uh, conscious, they are, uh, they are trying to live more healthy just because they don't want to get, and they, they don't want to get the infection or ayaw nilang ma-include doon sa fatality. Okay? Now, like I said, uh, Philippines now is facing an epidemic of diabetes. And if you can see in your screen right now, one in every five Filipinos are already diabetic or pre-diabetic. Ikaw na nanonood ngayon, baka hindi mo alam na diabetic ka. You will never know unless you get yourself tested. Alright? So, if this is one in every five, bilangin mo kung ilang kayo dyan sa family ninyo. Okay, so if this is five adults living in one household, one among you may be diabetic already or pre-diabetic. No? So pag-uusapan natin ano yung difference ng, ng pre-diabetic sa diabetic. Okay, uh, another data I want to show you here, this is a, a bit disturbing uh, kasi ang Pilipinas is number five. We are ranked fifth among diabetes hotspot in Western Pacific Region. Okay? So, number five tayo ang galing natin mag-produce ng mga patients na may diabetes. Okay? Sa cancer, number one tayo in terms of breast cancer. Okay? Pero sa diabetes, number five naman tayo. Alright? Okay. So, uh, ngayon, pag-uusapan natin kung ano ba talaga ang diabetes. Kasi dati, ang alam natin, diabetes type 1 lang, diabetes type 2. Uh, pero ngayon, sa mga guidelines natin, may tinatawag na kasi tayo ngayon na pre-diabetes. If you notice, dati, kapag uh, nag-request ang doktor natin ano, ng uh, blood sugar test, uh, minsan nakikita natin doon na medyo above the normal limit siya. So, usually, ang sinasabi natin sa pasyente is borderline na sila. No? So, Ngayon, sa diabetes diagnosis, we already call it pre-diabetes. So, sige, pag-usapan natin ngayon on uh, kung paano mo masasabi na may pre-diabetes ka or may diabetes ka na. Okay? So, ang makikita nyo sa screen nyo ngayon, you will see there, uh, ito yung mga test na ginagamit natin to diagnose a patient na may diabetes. So, ngayon, uh, ginagamit na natin yung A1C. Uh, kasi yung A1C, yun yung nagbibigay ng average blood sugar natin in 2 to 3 months time. So, doon natin nakikita kung controlled yung blood sugar ng pasyente or kung tama ba yung binibigay nating gamot. Kung nag-work ba yung gamot sa kanya or kung yung ating binibigay na advice sa kanya, ginagawa niya ba o hindi. Okay? So, yun yung ginagamit natin. Uh, but usually, ang nakasanayan nating nire-request uh, specifically, ano, uh, is the fasting blood sugar or yung FBS. Okay, so ito yung fasting glucose. Uh, minsan naman ginagamit din natin yung oral glucose tolerance test. Or minsan tinatawag din natin yung uh, postprandial. No? Ibig sabihin, 2 hours after eating, kinukuna natin ng blood sugar, titignan kung mataas siya o hindi. Now, how do you say a patient uh, or how do you diagnose a patient with prediabetes? So, ang eto, nakikita nyo sa screen nyo ngayon, uh, kung ang A1C ng pasyente is 5.7 to 6.4%, that is pre-diabetes. Uh, kung yung fasting glucose, yung FBS, no, is um, equivalent to 100 or more than 100 to 125 milligrams per DL, yun ang level ng 
pre-diabetes. Ito yung sinasabi natin dati na borderline. Minsan, natutuwa pa nga yung mga pasyente kasi sinasabi natin borderline kayo, sir. So, ibig sabihin, uh, may magagawa pa sila. Ano? Okay, so, yung OGTT or yung oral glucose tolerance test ng pasyente na may pre-diabetes is equivalent to 140 or above uh, Uh, 140 milligrams per dl. So, ibig sabihin, it should be um, below 200 milligrams per dl lang. Kasi pag uh, 200 na or more, ang diagnosis natin ay diabetes na. Okay? So, just to be clear, pag diabetic ang pasyente, the A1C should be above 6.4. So, pag yung A1C nyo ay 6.5, magbibigay na tayo ng diagnosis na diabetic na yung pasyente. Or kung yung fasting blood glucose natin or fasting blood sugar is equivalent to 126 or more than 126 mg per dl in two separate occasions. That means dalawang beses kasi hindi ibig sabihin na one time lang yung nakaagad ng diagnosis. No? So, dalawang beses natin kukunan yan. So, if it's equivalent to 126 or more, That means diabetic na yung pasyente. At yung OGTT naman, or means, minsan yung postprandial test, tinitake din natin if it's equivalent to 200 mg per dl or more, meaning ang pasyente ay diabetic na. What are the symptoms of diabetes? Uh, of course, marami kasing nagsasabi may diabetes sila but they don't really have any symptom at all. But we have dia we have classic diabetes symptoms, okay? So first, frequent urination, lagi silang umiihi. Second, uh, feeling of thirsty, lagi silang umiinom. And then increase of appetite, they also have blurred vision and they always feel tired. So, mamaya, mapag-uusapan natin bakit ito yung mga simptoma ng mga may diabetes. You will always see them inom ng inom. Why? Kasi yung sugar mataas sa dugo. Okay? So, the sugar is hyper-concentrating in the blood. And so, it needs to be diluted with water. Kaya inom sila ng inom. So, since inom sila ng inom, they will also urinate frequently. So, bakit sila kain ng kain? Kasi yung sugar hindi pumapasok sa cells. They stay in the blood vessel. Nasa ugat lang siya. Hindi siya pumapasok sa cell. So, your body thought they are hungry, so that's why they keep eating. Okay? So, we'll discuss further on that. The blurred vision usually happens as a complication of diabetes. And of course, feeling tired kasi walang energy yung cell. Kasi nga, yung sugar hindi nakakapasok doon sa cells. Okay, so diabetics should be aware of the following. Apat itong lagi natin sinasabi. Number one, numero uno, is heart health. Because a diabetic uh, patient may not die of, uh, say, renal failure, but they may die of ischemic heart disease. Okay? Yung number one cause of death. Why? Because diabetic is an atherogenic condition. Ibig sabihin, nagpapanaro siya ng ugat ng ating puso. Okay? So, kumikipot yung ugat ng puso natin, hindi nakakadaloy na maayos yung dugo. Okay? So, that may cause ischemia. Number two, na dapat pag-ingatan sa, sa diabetic patients is the kidney function. Alright? So, kasi ma madalas sa kanila nagkakaroon ng end-stage renal disease just because of long-staying diabetes. Of course, kailangan ni pag-ingatan yung kanilang mata. Nakita natin doon sa complications kanina, yung pinakita natin doon sa screen, ano? So, they may develop cataract, they may develop glaucoma, and then they may uh, develop also diabetic retinopathy. So, kung titignan mo, tatlong kondisyon ka agad yan, just because of having high blood sugar. So, if you were if you were to think of it, is it really worth it? Of, with all these types of complication that you may have, nag-aabang sa'yo yun, you know? Uh, yung pang kakainin mo on your plate right now, just because of that appetite you have, is really worth it? No? Ang mahirap lang kasi ngayon, these complications doesn't really happen right away. So, hindi siya nakakatakot kasi matagal pa siya mangyayari. And some other, and actually many patients, won't um, appreciate the complications kasi nga matagal pa siya mangyayari. Alright, so diabetes is in fact a multifactorial nature. So, bakit nagkakadiabetes ang pasyente? Genetics is one factor. So, pwedeng yung parents mo may diabetes, uh, both sides pwedeng may diabetes, but we also have the epigenetic. When you say epigenetic, ano yung naging behavior ng mother mo when you were in the womb? 
Alright? But the thing is, we are not predestined to have diabetes. Hindi ibig sabihin na kung yung parents mo may diabetes, uh, may diabetes ka na rin. Alright? Because what I'm seeing right now, basically in my practice sa clinic, ano, kapag ako nagdadiagnose ng pasyente na may diabetes, say, nakita ko yung kanyang blood sugar, and this is the second uh, test that we have. And then I would tell my patient, Mom, may diabetes na po kayo. Uh, you know, I am expecting to see a sad face. Parang nag, yun ang ini-expect kong makita sa pasyente na malulungkot sila kasi may diagnosis na sila ngayon. But, unfortunately, hindi yun ang nakikita ko sa pasyente. Usually, I would see, oh, may diabetes na ako. Alam mo, Dok, kasi yung parents ko may diabetes din. Tapos yung kapatid ko may diabetes din. So, ngayon ako na yung may diabetes. So, parang tanggap na lang talaga nila na this time, it's their turn to have diabetes. no So, just because of... Uh, uh, it's not only the food intake, it's not only the lifestyle, it's not only the genetics, but this is multifactorial nature in the development of diabetes. Of course, included here is the lifestyle factor. Ano yung kinakain natin? Yung diet, exercise, the stress level of the person, and some other habits na meron siya. Of course, environmental factor and microbiome also plays a role. Now, um, here, I wanna let you see in your screen, the epigenetics in type 2 diabetes. These are the key influencers. So, ano yung magiging, ano yung positive influencer in terms of developing type 2 diabetes? So, you will see here the polyphenols that you can see from uh, plant food sources, yung vitamins, no? particularly vitamin B, exercise, stress reduction, and then the healthy diet of your parents will actually give you a positive result. Alright, so ibig sabihin, hindi ka ma mas mataas ang chance na hindi ka magdi-develop ng diabetes kahit na may genetic predisposition ka. But what are the negative key influencer? Of course, number one is sugar. Refined sugar, alcohol, saturated fat, processed food, and the unhealthy parental diet. Kung ano kinakain ng parents mo when you were still uh, in the womb while your parent is conceiving you. Okay? So, yan yung epigenetics. Now, the key player in diabetes development, in fact, is the insulin resistance. Now, let me introduce you to your pancreas. Okay? Lapay sa Tagalog. Yung pancreas, uh, katabi po yan, nasa baba banda ng ating stomach. Okay? So, katabi siya ng ating small intestine. Okay, so ngayon, may ipapakita ako sa inyo very short video. This is just a minute video para makita nyo kung anong nangyayari uh, sa ating katawan uh, when we eat carbohydrates. Ano? So, alam natin pag kumakain tayo ng any form of carbohydrates, whether ang source niyan ay healthy or not, pare-pareho lahat yan nakukonvert into glucose. Ang pagkakaiba lang yan, pag ang kinain natin ay refined carbohydrates, mas mabilis siyang napuproseso. So, that means, uh, libawa, pag uminom tayo ng soft drinks, it's composed of sugar, yun, liquid sugar ayun, liquid sugar siya. So, pag ininom mo siya, dire-diretso tataas ka agad ang blood sugar mo, ano? Pero pag kumain ka, say, for example, sweet potato or kamote, mas matagal na maitaas yung blood sugar mo kasi may presence ng fiber, kailangan nyo pang i-digest, medyo mas matagal na may uh, naaakit yung sugar doon sa ating blood level, okay? So, yun yung difference. But, regardless of the source, again, lahat yan ng carbohydrates will be converted into smaller particles pag kinain natin and then makukonvert siya into glucose kasi yun ang kilala ng cells natin para makapasok siya sa ating cells at gagamitin yun as energy source, alright? So, Say, for example, in this video, nakikita nyo, this is a person eating uh, uh, spaghetti. Para makarating yan doon sa cells natin, dito sa video, nakikita nyo, example is the muscle cell. Bakit yung muscle cell? Uh, kasi dito natin uh, nakikita yung insulin resistance as an example. So, pag kumain tayo ng uh, uh, glucose or carbohydrates, makikita natin dito yung mga sugar nandoon sa labas ng muscle cell. So, that means nasa bloodstream siya, nasa dugo. So, what will happen is that etong glucose na to na nasa labas ng ating cells, kailangan makapasok doon sa loob ng muscle cells. Now, hindi siya makakapasok ng diretsyo sa ating muscle cell kasi kakailanganin niya yung insulin. Now, doon sa ating muscle cell, eto yung nakikita nyo sa figure ngayon, may insulin receptor dyan. So, didikit ngayon yung insulin 
insulin doon sa insulin receptor and then it will activate a lot of processes. Okay? So, may mga enzyme activation na nangyayari dyan. Uh, and then, what will happen in the end is maa-activate yung glucose vesicle. Yan, nakikita nyo. So, meron siyang daanan. So, it looks like a door uh, para makapasok ngayon yung mga sugar sa ating cell. Alright? So, ngayon, gagamitin na nung cells natin yung sugar na yun para sa energy niya. Now, what will happen in this case? Uh, dito, sa next na na scenario, ang nakikita nyo, there's no presence of insulin. Walang insulin in the bloodstream. So, pag walang insulin, yung sugar, nasa labas lang. Nasa labas ng cell. It's in the blood vessel. Nasa dugo natin. Hindi nakakapasok sa cells. So, ito yung nangyayari sa may mga type 1 diabetes. So, uh, the only means for them to survive and to live healthy is to have exogenous sources of insulin. Okay? Now, uh, in this scenario, ang nakikita nyo dito is another type of diabetes, which is type 2 diabetes. Ngayon, may presence ng insulin. Nakikita nyo sa figure, di ba? Dumidikit din naman yung insulin doon sa receptor. Ngayon, the problem here is that the receptor is not activated. Okay? So, may mga insulin, there are a lot of insulin in the bloodstream, kaya lang yung receptors are not activated. There must be something gumming up inside the the myocellular uh, the, the the cell of the muscles kung bakit hindi na activate yung ating receptors and what you can see here in the um, in the muscle cell is what we call the intramyocellular lipids coming from the bloodstream so dumadami yan nasa loob ng, ng muscle cell natin and then they will cause toxic fatty breakdown uh, the products and free radicals. So, yun yung napuproduce nila and somehow, it will block the signaling pathway process doon sa receptors. O, nangyayari, kahit marami pang insulin, normal yung pancreas nung pasyente, nagpuproduce siya ng insulin, however, hindi naman na-activate yung glucose vesicle. Kaya, ang nakikita nyo ngayon doon sa screen, ninyo ngayon, yung blood sugar nandun lang sa ugat, hindi pumapasok sa loob ng muscle cell. Now, the less so, I want you to learn right now, ito yung importante, just because of the intramyocellular fat, saan galing yung fat na yun? Galing yun sa fat doon sa bloodstream. Saan galing yung fat sa bloodstream? Da, galing yun sa fat na kinakain natin. Alright? So, just because of those fats na nando doon sa loob ng, ma ng ating muscle cell, hindi na-activate yung insulin receptor, so ang effect na naiiwan doon yung sugar sa labas ng ating muscle cell. Nando doon siya sa bloodstream. Kaya pag kinunan ka ng dugo, doon nakikita na mataas ang blood sugar mo. Mataas yung sugar mo sa dugo kasi hindi siya pumapasok sa cell. So, ang nangyayari ngayon, hindi pumapasok sa cell yung sugar, walang energy yung ginagamit yung cell. Kung walang energy yung ginagamit ang cell, ang pag-intindi ng katawan natin, nagugutom tayo, di ba? Kasi wala kang energy. Kaya yung may, may mga diabetes, kain sila ng kain. So, mataas yung sugar nila, lagi silang gutom. That's one of the symptoms ng diabetes, di ba? And then, since yung sugar nando doon sa, ano, sa blood vessel natin, uh, hyper-concentrated yung sugar doon sa dugo, uh, kailangan namang ma-dilute yun. Kailangan mailabas yun through the, uh, no, through the kidneys, through sa pag-ihi nila. Kaya, kailangan uminom naman ng uminom ang pasyente. Kaya doon nang gagaling yung basic symptom ng diabetes. Inom sila ng inom ng tubig, lagi na uuhaw. Kain sila ng kain kasi walang energy yung cell. Ngayon, ihi rin sila ng ihi. So, those are the symptoms at yun ang nangyayari sa ugat natin when we have diabetes. Uh, you will see here uh, na yung intramyocellular lipid concentration actually decreases the sensitivity, insulin sensitivity of any individual consuming free fatty acids, fats, taba, mantika. Okay? Clear. Free fatty acids in just a matter of 3 hours after eating. Approximately 3 hours after eating, and you will see in your screen kasi this is about 160 minutes, no? After about 3 hours of eating fats, taba, mantika, insulin sensitivity decreases.
nag-uumpisa na kaagad yung insulin resistance. Tanong, how many times are you eating in each day? Tatlo. Madalas sinasabi tatlo. But honestly, marami sa ating kumakain five times a day. Kasi may dalawang snacks pa tayo. Pero pa dun sa midnight snack kung minsan. You know? Now, if you look at the three major meals na kinakain natin, if this is composed of saturated fat in particular, sa umaga, three hours after, bababa yung insulin sensitivity because of the presence of fats, right? Sa tanghali, kumain ka uli ng fats. After three hours, bababa uli yung insulin sensitivity. And then sa dinner, ganun din yung kinain mo, bababa rin yung insulin sensitivity. And this will happen over and over again. And so, that is equivalent to developing diabetes type 2. Okay? Secondary to insulin resistance. Dati kasi, dati sa medisina, ang alam namin, what causes diabetes is the sugar. What causes diabetes yung yung uh, asukal na kinakain. So right now, yes, uh, this is the caloric load that you have. But unfortunately, what causes insulin resistance is the fat that we eat from the food every single day that causes insulin resistance. And I hope that's clear. Now, uh, studies are showing that by age 20 years old, well-established na yung pancreas mo. Okay, well-established na yung islets, the beta cells that produces insulin. However, just because of these free fatty acids, yung fats na kinakain natin, it causes death to the pancreatic cells. Alright? Just because of the lipotoxicity. Take note of that. So it's not only the increase in sugar that causes death to the pancreatic cell, but also the fat. More so with the fat. All right. So that in this uh, in this research, it was found out na most probably, yung mga na diagnose ng type two diabetes have already fifty percent decrease in number of their pancreatic cells. And over time, bumababa pa yan ng about twenty percent, depende doon sa pagcontrol nila ng blood sugar nila. Okay. Now. Um, Bottom line here, the consumption of hypercaloric diet, for example, which is rich in saturated fats, in the setting of unfavorable genetic background, ibig sabihin, may family history ka ng diabetes, this is equals to pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes. So yung tatlong factor na yun, kung meron ka, magkakadevelop ka ng diabetes. No? I hope that is clear. Now, let me show you some of the studies that were conducted. Uh, actually, this is a study uh, that was done in uh, San Luis Valley. This is a diabetes study. Uh, you will see there in the screen. Uh, they found out that a daily consumption of 40 grams of fat increases the risk of becoming diabetes by six folds. Six folds. Now, ano yung 40 grams ng fat? So, yun ang magandang i-check kasi usually tao ngayon hindi siya check ilang gram mo yan eh. Ano? So, when we say 40 grams of fat, how much of a fat you are consuming every single day? Now, in this screen, now I wanted to show you here, regardless of the source, regardless of the source, kasi maraming pagkain, may fat content din, hindi rin naman tayo aware. Now, in this uh, slide, you will see, uh, say for example, the pork spare ribs. No? Yung pork spare ribs is about 70% fat. 70% fat. So, ibig sabihin, pag kumain ka ng pork spare ribs na approximately 100 grams, 70% non is fat. So, that is equivalent to 70 grams already. Now, in that research, it was found out na 40 grams lang na makonsume mo. That will increase your risk to developing diabetes six-folds. Now, uh, another slide here that I want to show you is the cholesterol content. Kung titignan mo dito dun sa cholesterol content, ano yung may pinakamataas? Kasi laging biniblame, di ba? It's the pork that has the highest cholesterol. In fact, if you'll see in the slide right now, the one with the highest cholesterol level is liver. Anything that has liver. So, ito yung atay ng manok, atay ng baboy, any liver na kinakain natin. Okay? Because there are about 275 milligrams of cholesterol per 100 grams dun sa liver na kinakain. Next to that, 
take note is egg, itlog. Okay? So, one egg will give you about 184 milligrams of cholesterol. This is medium size, plain boiled. Remember, plain boiled. Kasi pag pinirito, madadagdagan yung fat, di ba? Kasi nagdagdag ka ng, ng uh, mantika. Now, you will see here, 184 milligrams of cholesterol ang isang egg yolk. Now, the, uh, the recommended daily allowance for cholesterol, as they say in the figure, is only 300 milligrams per day. So, isang itlog lang, 184 na. Paano pag dalawa? Breakfast pa lang yun. Wala pa yung lunch. Wala pa yung dinner. ba? Now, Third is actually shrimp and crustaceans. So, kung titignan mo, fourth is chicken. Mas mataas ang cholesterol ng chicken sa pork. Okay? Especially in the uh, poultry industry right now kasi iba ang practices ngayon sa poultry industry. Okay? So, I will not be talking about more uh, on, on the cholesterol kasi pag-uusapan natin yan when we get into heart disease. Okay? Uh, I'm just trying to tell you here that things that we're consuming, in fact, every single day adds up for us to gain weight. So, pag tayo lumalaki, you will notice type 2 diabetic patients started with a heavy weight. No, medyo malalaki sila, uh, specifically may central obesity sila. Pwedeng maliliit yung braso nila, maliliit yung binti nila, pero yung kanilang chan nandoon doon, yung ano, nandoon yung fats, yung adipose cells, nandoon concentrated. So we call it central obesity. Okay? So now in this study again, um, um, that was conducted. This is the nurses' health study, the famous nurses' health study. You will see here uh, one of their findings is that uh, yung mga na, nasa highest end ng weighing scale, ibig sabihin yung mga overweight, they develop diabetes 40 times higher in frequency than those at the lower end. Ibig sabihin yung ideal ang kanilang body weight. Now. Uh, what we're trying to emphasize here in this study that they saw uh, is that saturated fat increases insulin resistance, secondary doon sa mga kinakain nila, of course, because of the weight that they have, uh, just because of the food, again, that they're eating. It causes intramyocellular lipid accumulation, nandudun na sa cell ng no ating uh, muscles, yung fats. And then what they're trying to see right now is the heme iron that also stores after eating red meat. Okay, so um, in this study, uh, this was actually conducted at Harvard, you know. Uh, this is a systematic review and meta-analysis uh, with over 200,000 people that they were able to track for a decade. So maraming tao ito, ano? So when you say systematic review, this is one of the most validated research na pwede nating uh, ipakita sa inyo kasi matagal na pag-aaral ito, sampung taon nilang pinag-aralan and then at the same time this is a collection of many researches already that they were able to publish. Now, what's amazing in this research, in this um, dietary studies is that kung makikita nyo sa screen nyo ngayon they were able to find out that when a person consumes approximately 4 ounces or 113 grams ng unprocessed meat, ibig sabihin karne you know, ito yung mga unprocessed, fresh meat na kinakain nila. When you consume 4 ounces of that every day, that will increase your diabetes risk by 20% already. Okay? So, yun yung isang findings nila in this research. Now, another findings that they have, which is uh, really very remarkable, is that if you took uh, 2 ounces or 60 grams tignan mo kung ano yung 60 grams no? konting konti kasi yan eh of processed red meat per day this will increase your diabetes risk by 50% so yung 60 grams na kinakain natin na processed meat that will pose you to develop risk of diabetes 50% napakataas nun so ano example ng processed meat natin ito yung bacon, corned beef meatloaf uh, sausages, hot dogs, kahit pa sabihin natin na chicken hot dog yan, etc. Okay? Um, or kahit pa sabihin natin na, na beef hot dog yan, that's what I meant. Okay? So, as long as you're consuming 60 grams of that uh, every single day, so that increases your risk to develop diabetes at 50%. Here, this is the famous Adventist Health Study. 
Okay? So the famous Adventist Health Study showed that women and men who are meat eaters have the tendency to develop more diabetes than those who are vegetarian or than those who are vegan. Okay? Now, I like to show you in this, uh, in this screen, after eating outside, Ano yung kinakain natin outside? Ano yung kinakain natin sa fast food? So say for example, we ate um, burger and then we have the french fries and then we have the pizza. After eating them, of course, we know very well that your uh, burger and then your french fries and then your, your pizza has all the saturated fats, diba? Now, after eating the saturated fats, this will have a negative in impact to your liver, to your muscle, and of course, it will increase the storage of adipose tissue. Yun yung fat cells natin. And eventually, will cause insulin resistance in your muscle cell. So, in your screen right now, you will see this is uh, how it looks like uh, when you put your muscle cell in the microscope, okay? So you will see the fat droplets inside the muscle uh, cell. So, uh, dapat ang laman nito is glucose. However, due to insulin resistance, ang laman niya is fats, okay? And so, uh, typically, ito yung picture ng muscle cell ng pasyente na may diabetes. Okay, so so much so about diabetes, what can we do pag ang pasyente may diabetes na? Now, let's start with researches again. Now, I will show you here some of the researches that utilizes lifestyle intervention. Ibig sabihin, ginamita nila ng nutrition, physical activity, stress management, smoking cessation, and then adequate sleep. Okay, so this is one of the famous study na gusto kong i-present sa inyo ngayon, na no? So, kung yung mga doktor na nakakapanood ng ating uh, presentation ngayon, alam na alam nila yon, kasi this is what we call the Diabetes Prevention Program, or we call it DPP. Ito, this is a three years program, tatlong taong ginawa yung study, and in this study, they have about 3,000 obese pre-diabetic patients. So, ibig sabihin, itong mga pasyente na to, uh, malalaki sila matataba sila, no? They are at the obese category and then they are pre-diabetic, hindi pa full-blown yung diabetes nila. Now, in this study, they explore the question of drugs or lifestyle. Now, in this case, ang pinag-aralan nila is metformin. So, ang ginawa nila, hinati nila yung 3,000 na participants into three groups and then they track them for three years. Tinignan nila kung ano yung magiging clinical outcomes. So, ibig sabihin, ini-investigate nila kung sino yung grupo na magkakaroon ng full-blown diabetes. Sino yung mas marami? Yung group 1? Yung group 1 kasi they were the placebo. So, they were receiving the gummy pills. Hindi nila alam na yung tinitake nila is not really a medicine. And then, yung group 2, sila yung uh, binibigyan ng metformin. Yun yung gamot na basic na gamot na tinitake ng mga pasyente natin na may diabetes, right? And then, yung group 3, Ito yung group naman that are receiving intensive therapeutic lifestyle. So, ibig sabihin, they change the lifestyle. Ang goal nila is to lose 7% of those excess weight. Remember, the participants are obese patients. And then, they ask the, the, the participants to walk about 150 minutes every week. So, 30 minutes per week in a physical activity. Now, at the end of the 3 years program, this is what they found. Uh, yung first group uh, who were receiving placebo, the gamma Pills, 29% of them uh, develop full-blown diabetes and that's expected. Tatlong taon yun na. And then, yung second group which are receiving medication, we are expecting na hindi lahat dapat makaka-develop uh, ng diabetes because they are already receiving the medication. However, 22% sa kanila nagkaroon pa rin ng full-blown diabetes. Alright? And you will see here, amazingly, yung group 3 who are receiving intensive therapeutic lifestyle, only 14% of them develop diabetes. So, kung titignan natin, this is already a 58% benefit. Just changing the lifestyle and reducing the weight. Uh, this is another study that was published in the Journal uh, of Applied Physiology. Uh, they saw here, this is in critical longevity, uh, this is uh, Dr. Neil Barnard's study. 
uh, that at the end of four weeks residential lifestyle program, now what I'm trying to, to let you see here is apat na linggong lifestyle change. Four weeks. Okay? So isang buwan na lifestyle change. So that means they use nutrition, physical activity, stress reduction, enough sleep, smoking cessation. Okay, so what happened after four weeks of lifestyle program, 76% of participants were off their oral drugs. Ibig sabihin, they don't need the medications anymore because their blood sugar were at the normal level already. And then 44% were off their insulin for those who were taking insulin shots. Okay, this is the study of, of Dr. Neil Barnard. Now, another study here uh, is that of Dr. Anderson, that within three weeks, now in this case, this is a three-week study, uh, 22 of his patients were off their insulin, and then the remaining six had their insulin reduced from 28 units to 14 units, and this is half in the same time frame. Now, let, rem let me remind you, we're only talking about three weeks here. Tatlong linggo. Okay? Uh, one of the best uh, slides that I want to show you. Uh, this is one of the earliest study uh, in diabetes. Uh, this happened in 1955. Sinong pinanganak no 1955? This is a study conducted by Dr. Inder Singh. Now, meron siyang 80 patients uh, who are taking insulin already. These are patients on insulin. Now, ang ginawa ni Dr. Inder Singh, he placed these patients into 11% calories from fat. Now, normally, what we're eating right now is about 35% of fat. Hindi ko alam sa inyo dyan sa inyong bahay, no? Kung titignan niyo yung inyong plato, hindi... Let's see how much of a fat you are consuming. Kasi pag kumain tayo outside, say kumain tayo sa fast food, we can never say that that is only 11% of fat because more of that is fat. Okay? Like yung pinakita kong example sa inyo kanina. Now, in this set of patients, 80 patients were placed into 11% calories with fat. And you know what happened? After 6 weeks, being on this diet, 50 out of 80 were off insulin already. And then, after another 18 weeks in the program, another 18 of them were off insulin. Now, if you look at your screen right now, you will see that this is about 85% success rate by utilizing lifestyle changes only as early as 1955. Now, yung mga pinapakita kong research sa inyo, matagal nang ginawa yan. Recently, in your screen, you will see here, this is the latest um, algorithm that we use when we manage type 2 diabetes. Okay, 2019 ito nilabas by the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists and American College of Endocrinology. You will see here in the pre-diabetes algorithm, ibig sabihin ng pre-diabetes, they're not full-blown diabetic yet, but hey, take note, you don't have to have full-blown diabetes to develop complications. Kasi maraming matagal ng pre-diabetic and then right now, full-blown diabetic sila, but they have the complications already. So that's why we already have the algorithm now na kailangan i-manage yung pasyente kahit nasa pre-diabetes stage pa lang sila. Now, you will see in this algorithm, top of the line, number one, nandyan sa taas, lifestyle therapy. Okay? Again, this is 2019 algorithm. Yung pinakita ko sa inyo earlier in the researches were done 1955, 2003, 2002. Now, this time, in this, in this uh, management guideline that we have, uh, 2019, Lifestyle therapy is number one in terms of managing patients with prediabetes. Ito naman yung sa glycemic control. You will see here, again, for patients who are already diagnosed with diabetes, you will see their lifestyle therapy, which is first in the line. So, again, the researches that are done this time in this generation are only validating the researches that were already done prior. Okay, uh, but it's also amazing that there is this uh, lady in the name of um, uh, Mrs. Ellen White who was able to write all of those guidelines clearly and perfectly in her books 
that were written over 80 years and 90 years already. And it's really amazing that right now, science is only validating whatever is written by this lady who is inspired by the Holy Spirit in writing her books, okay? Now, um, in that guideline that I showed you, you will see here the composition of the lifestyle therapy. Now, in this time, this is already the American College of Endocrinology that is describing kung ano yung gagawin doon sa treatment for diabetes. Please don't be amazed because it's the same thing that those people in the old times were doing. Pareho lang ang ginigay nilang recommendation. First, nutrition. Number two, physical activity. Number three, sleep, behavioral support, and smoking cessation. Okay? So, science before is being validated by science now. Okay? So, here, uh, let's start with lifestyle intervention one, which is nutrition. So, what we usually give to patients with diabetes, kailangan lower caloric intake that will resolve, result to weight loss and improve the A1C. Okay? O yung, ito yung test na ginagawa natin for diabetes. Total caloric intake. So, um, in, the next, um, in the next discussions that we will have, uh, I hope to discuss more of how much calorie you will get per plate. Kasi, uh, as long as you're eating whole food plant-based diet, it's really hard to overeat. Diba? So, example, if you eat potato, patatas, how can you even finish five large potatoes in one sitting? Mahirap, di ba? Yes, you may consume five large potatoes in five days maybe, three days maybe. But in one sitting, you can easily finish one tube of Pringles, right? Yung one tube of Pringles having about 1,000 calories is just the same of the calories you will get from those huge potatoes that you may be able to finish for three days, five days. Pero yung isang Pringles, yung isang potato chips, isang upuan mo lang, wala pa isang oras, ubus mo na yan. And that is calorie-laden cal food. Okay? So that's why in whole food plant-based diet, mahirap mag-overeat. Okay, I'll give you another example. Very classic. If you eat um, unpolished rice, this is brown rice, one cup of unpolished rice, halos hindi mo maubos. But if you eat refined rice, which is white rice, yung isang cup, kulang na kulang. Okay? Parang hindi umabot sa chan. Parang kailangan pa ng one, another one or another two cups for you to get filled. So that's how uh, important it is to eat whole food plant-based diet, specifically in patients with diabetes. Why? Uh, you will see in the screen right now that whole food plant-based diet improves insulin sensitivity, the health of your beta cells, it normalizes angiogenesis, it lowers the overall endothelial cell injury that was brought about by increased blood sugar. Okay? So why are we talking about whole food plant-based here? Please take note that plant-based diet is totally different from whole food plant-based diet. Okay? Ano yung difference niya? Again, potato chips is plant-based. It's vegan. No? Pero yung whole food plant-based is patatas. Alright? Nakita niyo yung difference? So, yung kamote Q, how do you say it? Diba yung kamote, piniprito nilalagyan ng, ng asukal. So, yung kamote Q or kamote chips, whatever you call it, that is still plant-based food, right? But it's processed. But the kamote na nilaga, that is whole. So, ano yung difference nila in terms of calorie? Few slices of this kamote with all the sugar and all the, and all the oil in there is totally higher than the calorie you will get from one piece of that kamote that is boiled. Okay? So, I hope that's clear. Now, with lifestyle intervention, we really wanted that patients would take more of the fiber. You will see here that increasing fiber intake will improve glycemic control, will enhance insulin sensitivity. Of course, it will decrease cholesterol kasi yung ating mga soluble fibers, they bind with the cholesterol. Okay? Para hindi lahat ng cholesterol na kinaka kinakain mo makakarating doon sa blood. And of course, it improves satiety. Remember that fibers 
mucus absorbs water so much so that when it reaches your stomach it uh, actually um, expands kaya parang mas nabubusog ka when you take food or plant-based food that are high in fiber now let me emphasize one thing here with diabetes remember in diabetic patients there is impaired angiogenesis Okay, yung angiogenesis, in fact, this is the development of new blood vessels. Uh, halimbawa, nagkaroon ng injury, dapat nagkakaroon ng new blood vessels there to uh, promote healing. Pero ito yung nawawala sa mga pasyente na may diabetes. That's why they have the increased risk to have poor wound healing. Meron silang peripheral neuropathy, meron silang diabetic retinopathy, meron silang renal disease. Some of them may develop cancer and some of them may develop cardiovascular disease. I don't know for whatever it's worth. For patients with diabetes, ang kailangan lang talaga, ibaba yung blood sugar the soonest you can and maintain them. Okay? So, lahat ng complication na pinag-uusapan natin is not totally worth it. Alright? So, uh, these are the foods that may optimize angiogenesis. What you can see in your screen right now uh, includes many of the food na meron tayo. Uh, na makikita natin locally. Okay, so, it includes uh, bok choy, o pet chai, cauliflower, broccoli, uh, nandiyan din yung soybean, tomatoes is also included, all the berries, uh, pineapple, apples, but of course, if the patient is having increased blood sugar, yung timing ng pagkain, of course, ng fruits, especially if they are sweet, they should be taken more in the morning kasi mas active sila. No? and less at night dahil matutulog na lang sila. Now, number two lifestyle intervention is physical activity. So this is quite simple. When we say physical activity, if diet works with diabetes, physical activity works the same with diabetes. So basically, this is only 30 minutes moderate physical activity with strength training five days in each week. Again, you just have to do the talk test. Uh, ibig sabihin ko ano yung ginagawa mong exercise as long as you can still talk and you can sing uh, that is actually low intensity physical activity. Pero kapag hindi ka na makakanta, you can still talk but you cannot sing anymore. You are at the moderate intensity of physical activity. But let me emphasize sa mga pasyente na may diabetes, nagdadagdag po tayo ng strength training. Ano ibig sabihin ng strength training? Kailangan po may weights. No? So, pwede mong gamitin yung body weight mo or you can use improvised weights that you have. Why? Because when the muscle is contracting, no? pag nagko-contract yung muscle, it utilizes glucose and it helps insulin sensitivity. Okay? So, that's why in patients with diabetes, we never allow them and we really discourage them na wala silang ginagawa more than two days. No? Kasi maganda yung effect ng uh, physical activity to the insulin uh, sensitivity. Okay? So again, 30 minutes moderate physical activity with strength training or weights, limang araw sa isang linggo. Okay? Now, uh, you will also see here uh, the next lifestyle intervention which is stress management. Now, uh, any person who is stressed, may have increased stress hormone. And an increase in stress hormone may increase blood sugar as well. So, in fact, a lot of study would, would show you that stress management improves long-term glycemic control. Okay? So, uh, pero kung nakikita nyo dito sa screen ninyo ngayon, you will see here another factor. We encourage patients with diabetes to have outdoor activity. Okay? Outdoor activity. You will notice right now, specifically for those patients living in the urban area, we have this what we call NDD or the Nature Deficit Disorder. Yung mga nakatira sa syudad. May, may, may pangalan na siya ngayon, Nature Deficit Disorder. Because we are bound in the four corners of this uh, building, nasa walls lang tayo ng mga bahay natin. And uh, in fact, we are living in an artificial jungle. Ano ibig sabihin ng artificial jungle? Nasa syudad ka, ang daming mga buildings na nandyan. You're in the artificial jungle. So a lot of patients right now are having nature deficit disorder. Now, there is this uh, 
pyramid that we have that I showed you, nakikita nyo sa screen nyo ngayon, uh, this is nature connection pyramid. What do you do? Okay? So here, as advice, daily, there should be outdoor nature play. Ibig sabihin, uh, pwede kang pumunta sa garden mo, mag-garden ka everyday. Next is nature exploring weekly. So, ibig sabihin, nature walk, you may visit places once in a week. And then monthly, you can go monthly, uh, monthly outing, you know, with your regional, kung saan, saan uh, uh, farm na pwede mong i-visit. And then yearly, you can go, pwede kang mag-visit sa wild. Go to the mountains or go to the lakes, kung lakes, go to the beaches, etc. You recharge yourself with the nature. You reconnect with nature. So check this out. Uh, we call this nature connection pyramid. And then lastly, in managing stress, is rest. Okay? When we say rest, a patient should have enough sleep. Seven to nine hours of sleep is necessary. Seven to eight hours kung actively working ka. Because it's only during sleep that our cells can recuperate. Remember, pag hindi tayo nakatulog, our body recognizes and interprets inadequate sleep as stress. Okay? So, pag hindi ka nakatulog, the night prior, the following day, cortisol hormone is high. Blood sugar is high. Okay? So, in rest, it's not only enough sleep. So, we included here Sabbath in the rest. Now, when we say Sabbath, this is a single day in the week that you are resting together with the Lord. You know, personally, I can't imagine myself without Sabbath in a week. So, I hope you do. So, kahit ang nature goes with the Sabbath, goes with the, with the day of rest. Uh, in fact, in organic agriculture and natural farming, we call this follow. Ibig sabihin ng follow, when you farm the land for six years, on the seventh year, you have to, you have, to have it rested. Hindi mo siya tataniman. So, it can fully recover. So, yung, mic, yung mga uh, organic matters mag-develop. So, that is happening in nature. It is written in the Bible. It's in the scripture. And your body needs it too. Okay? So, uh, that's included in rest. Okay, so, I want to emphasize here some other added benefits that you will have in lifestyle intervention. These are the, the last few slides. First is we are protecting your pancreatic beta cells. Remember I told you earlier, when you are diagnosed with diabetes, most probably 50% of your pancreatic cells are not already functioning very well. Pag hindi mo pa na-control yan over time, about 20% of that nadidegrade din. So what we do with lifestyle intervention is to protect your pancreatic beta cell. To function very well. Next, in lifestyle intervention, you are not only uh, improving glucose, you are not only improving blood sugar, but we are also normalizing the lipid profile. Yung ating cholesterol bumababa din. Yung lipid profile natin bumababa din. And then, there is also down regulation of inflammatory processes. And that is one of the most important thing that is happening when you have lifestyle change. Yung inflammation sa katawan natin bumababa, basically because you're reducing your weight, you are having anti-inflammatory diet as well. And then lastly, it stabilizes your immune system. Remember, diabetic patients are considered immunocompromised because the glucose, the glucose hinders the function of the innate cells and also uh, actually the immune cells in general. So when we have lifestyle intervention, when you improve your lifestyle, when you are a diabetic, it stabilizes, it stabilizes your immune system in many different mechanisms. Okay? Now, lifestyle intervention reduces pain, uh, or secondary to peripheral neuropathy. It improves diabetic retinopathy. It will also help you overcome with food addiction and food dependency because this is the problem of patients with diabetes. With lifestyle intervention, it helps you reprogram your taste buds. Okay? You will notice that the food you used to love hindi na nakaka, hindi na siya masarap sa iyo ngayon because the taste buds have 
is already changing and it will help you naturally detoxify your body as well and then lastly dun sa dalawa na an uh, added effect when you when you have lifestyle intervention is that it is cost effective wala naman po siyang gastos okay you don't spend anything here in fact mas makakasave ka pa no, specifically, when you change into whole food plant-based diet, you will realize that your expenditure, expenditure with food will totally decrease. And then lastly, this is sustainable. Okay? Since this is cost-effective, not much of an expense, of course, this will be sustainable. Alright, so I'd just like to summarize here. How do we disarm diabetes? First, we have to eat whole food plant-based diet with low saturated fat and high in fiber. Pangalawa, regular moderate intensity physical activity with strength training kasama yung weights, 30 minutes limang araw sa isang linggo. And the next, quit smoking. And the next, stress management, which includes adequate sleep, outdoor activity, and rest. Now remember, diabetes is the mother of all disease. What we see right now is that diabetes is affecting both young and old. Walang exempted. The youngest patient I have with diabetes type 2 is 11 years old. Dati, diabetes, you can be at your 40s. Now, you can be at your 14. So, diabetes is affecting both young and old, basically because of the lifestyle that we have, the lifestyle and the routine that we do every single day. But one good news here is that we can do something. If this is lifestyle related, we just have to modify our lifestyle, learn about lifestyle modification, educate yourself, and then start living a healthy lifestyle. Always remember that living a healthy lifestyle is the cheapest way of giving yourself a good health care because having a disease right now may be a disaster. Mm -hmm.